Desmond Tutu is on my mind this week. For Lent this year, Father Eric Stell of St. John's Episcopal and I have been presenting every Wednesday on The Saints for Today. Each week we take a look at a different Christian from history and see how they balanced reaching out in solidarity to people who were unlike them to, uh, with maintaining their principles and their focus on the gospel. This past week I was privileged to share the story of Desmond Tutu. Tutu, of course, was one of the leaders involved in dismantling apartheid in South Africa in the last half of the 20th century. I've been amazed and humbled over this last couple of weeks as I've been reading about him to learn not only of his work, but how deeply and genuinely he cared for all people, not just the black South Africans who were suffering under and resisting apartheid, but also the white South Africans who feared and hated and rejected him. I talked about him and told stories for half an hour on Wednesday, and I'm not going to do that again here, but I do want to share one story to kind of give you a sense of this man and who he is. So Tutu was elected Bishop of Johannesburg in 1985. Actually, he wasn't elected, he was appointed. The General Assembly, whose job it was to elect the uh, bishop, couldn't make a decision. There was too much debate over his election, and so the election had to be referred to the Synod of Bishops who appointed him. Um, anyway, after his appointment, one particular white priest who was a critic of his and was very adamantly opposed to his nomination for bishop found himself in the hospital for two weeks. And that man was surprised to find that on every single day of those two weeks, his new bishop called him out of genuine care for his well-being to offer him support and pastoral care. That's the kind of man that Bishop Tutu is. But as amazing in that man and his life are, I find myself this week equally amazed by the very idea of apartheid. It seems so alien to me to have such deep-seated and ingrained disdain for another human being, especially based on something so arbitrary as skin color or ethnicity. And yet, such prejudicial racism is real. So real, in fact, that there has been a day set aside every year, this day, March 21st, to acknowledge the toll that racism has taken on our world and to recommit ourselves to ending it. Although apartheid was an official government policy in South Africa, we in this country are, of course, no strangers to the idea. In America, we are still dealing with the aftermath of slavery and the lasting effects it continues to have on our national consciousness. As a nation, we have internalized those ideas and those experiences as a part of our social psyche. So much that uh, they affect how we treat not just people of African descent or the native inhabitants of this continent, but all people of color. Whether we agree with those ideas or are actively working against them, you have to admit, they still shape, they're still an integral part of who we are today. They still shape who we are and what we're doing. I was appalled this week to come across a quote from Hendrik Vervoort, the one-time Minister of Native Affairs in South Africa, who said, There is no place for the Bantu, which was a native tribe, there is no place for the Bantu in the European community above the level of certain forms of labor. What is the use of teaching a Bantu child mathematics when it cannot use it in practice? But I was equally appalled to read that Bishop Tutu himself had internalized these negative ideas about his own people. He recalls how once when traveling on a Nigerian plane, he had this feeling, this nagging worry on discovering that both the pilot and the co-pilot were black, the result of having been conditioned his whole life to think that only whites could be entrusted with such positions of responsibility. How terrible is that? To have these own ideas about your very own kinsmen. Racism has been ingrained in American culture almost from its very beginning. 
It's been called America's original sin. I wonder if today, I wonder today if we might also call it America's old covenant. We often talk about a covenant as a promise or an agreement or a contract, but there's such a thing as a social covenant too, the agreement or the pattern upon which our society is built. It might just as easily be described as a pattern or a paradigm, a framework that establishes how things are, how we operate. Racism is at the heart of our national paradigm, our national covenant. Our problem, a problem shared by much of the world at this point, exported and spread by European colonialism, in which America played a seminal part, is that although we ended the practice of slavery, we never changed the paradigm. After either escaping or being emancipated from slavery, the first hurdle that black Americans faced was the fact that they had nothing. No money, no property, no means to make a living, uh, no family, no social connections to help them out. Everything was owned by white Americans. Folks, folks who managed to escape sometimes found a means of supporting themselves, sometimes uh, through the charity or uh, compassion of um, generous white folks. But after the end of the Civil War, the country had this glut of newly free, newly impoverished people with no means of supporting themselves. The solution, if you can call it that, that was found was sharecropping. Many of those people went back to work for the very same people who had enslaved them. And they received as compensation only a share of the crops which they produced. Slavery had been officially outlawed, but in essence, it was still practiced. It was still the reality. And thus, the Old Covenant continued. If we are ever really to escape the shadow of slavery and racism, we will need a new paradigm. After apartheid ended, the nation of South Africa was faced with a massive problem. The white citizens who had formerly held all the power were still living in South Africa. The new democratically elected government of South Africa had a choice to make. They could have done to those whites what the whites had done to them. They could have retaliated, simply turned apartheid back against the people who had invented it. Or they could have tried what America tried. They could have instituted some nominal laws and policies designed to protect freedoms and sort of um, shift the balance a little bit, and pretend everything was fine. But there was too much animosity, too much anger and frustration. There would have just been more violence. These non-solutions were part of the same old European paradigm. So instead, the new president, Nelson Mandela, and the new Archbishop of Cape Town, Desmond Tutu, began establishing a new paradigm. They formed the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. This new paradigm, this new covenant, didn't operate under the same retributive individualistic rules that the old apartheid government had. Those rules and patterns are what had caused the problem. They couldn't solve it. So instead of relying on Western ideas about justice and crime and punishment, the South Africans turned to distinctly African ideas. In many African cultures, justice is restorative rather than retributive. Simply put, this means that when someone commits a crime, the focus isn't on punishing the guilty or on catharsis for the victims. It's on the health and the healing and the well-being of the whole community. The guilty are still held accountable, but there's an awareness that they are still a part of this community. And an effort is made to bring them back into it. A communal solution must involve healing for the perpetrator as well as for the wronged party, and indeed for everybody else in the community. And so the Truth and Reconciliation Commission heard the testimonies of people who experienced the horrors of apartheid firsthand. Violence, imprisonment, persecution, humiliation. But it also heard the stories of those who had committed the horrors. Both persecutors and persecuted 
had the chance to hear from one another, to come face to face with the pain that had been inflicted and the people who had inflicted it. And then they had to work together to decide how to move forward to bring healing. It was a long, arduous, emotional process. It's still going on even today. It's far from perfect. A lot of people report that they felt it was ineffective. But most people who, in, who were involved with it agree that it did bring about healing, that it began repairing that damage that had been done by uh, decades of apartheid. This is perhaps more than we can say about what's been done in our own country to attempt to bring, out, bring about healing after chattel slavery and segregation and uh, anti-immigration laws and the Chinese Exclusion Act and so many other things. Now a century and a half after the end of slavery, many think that it's too late to do anything. Many more wonder why we can't just move on. But how can we move on when we're still living under the same old covenant, the same paradigm that created the problem? The thought of trying something new, especially after so much time has passed, is frightening. Those of us with privilege are afraid of losing that privilege, of being forced to give up what we consider to be ours, what has been ours for so long. People worry about opening old wounds, about the difficulty of figuring out what is fair and just, about being taken advantage of or being perceived as taking advantage. The same old antebellum fears wear new faces and convince us that our safety or our social order is in peril. Perhaps for these reasons, conversations about reparations or criminal justice reform have yet to gain much traction. If we are to move ahead in the work of dismantling racism, we are going to have to find a new way of being to make a new covenant with one another. Of course, it's frightening to consider starting over from scratch, to be faced with that possibility of failure. I can only imagine that such similar fears gripped the hearts of those who first heard I, uh, Jeremiah's words about God's new covenant. When a people's entire identity is founded on that old covenant, any mention of a new covenant, no matter how rosy the promise, is still terrifying. It's for this reason that Jesus says, those who love their life lose it. He's not issuing a new commandment. He's not making a threat. He's just stating fact. As long as we remain focused on ourselves and our own well-being and the well-being of those in our tribe, the people who look or think or act or believe like us, we will just keep circling the drain, drawing ever closer to the big drop. In order to break out of that cycle of hurt and fear and loss, Jesus says, we need to paradoxically stop focusing on survival. Stop focusing on our own well-being and learn to hate our lives. I wonder if we wouldn't do well to take a page from South Africa's book, to focus instead on the health of our whole community, our whole nation, rather than just trying to protect the rights of individual groups. Maybe we could even use our own Truth and Justice, excuse me, Truth and Re Reconciliation Commission. That kind of a letting go is tantamount to death. It's tantamount to throwing our lives away, to throwing away everything we hold dear and know to be effective. But Jesus reminds us that thanks to God's promise and God's presence, death is always a gateway to new life. A new covenant can be a hard promise to which to cling. But along with that promise is the assurance that we never walk the road alone. Jesus doesn't just tell us about new life, he shows it to us. By letting go of his own life, laying it down for those he calls friends. 
friends, by the way, who were the very people who betrayed and rejected and killed him. He experiences new life. Life which he then shares with us. Whoever serves me must follow me, he says. I am the way and the truth and the life, he says. The question for us is whether we have the courage to follow where that way leads us. In South Africa, with the help of Archbishop Tutu and others, they were able to step out in courage and find a path toward healing to let the old covenant die, and to find new life in a new way of being. A life that made um, for black and white South Africans together. Their journey is far from over. But I still wonder if it isn't a testimony to the truth of Jesus' words. An invitation to us to take a similar leap of faith we truly wish to see the end of racism. Maybe, just maybe, Jesus is right. If we let go of our lives for the good of all, maybe we will end up finding new life that is eternal.